two, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, without uh, further ado, let's introduce the next speaker, Kustadin Golev, which is a very well-known Bulgarian Java user group member. Thank you. He has done several talks already, and I hope all of you will enjoy his next talk. Yeah. Thank you, Naiden. So, thank you. Welcome, and I'm, I'm glad to see so many people interested in uh, such a boring topic like test code. And uh, I hope that uh, after this uh, talk, I'm going to show you how you can get more and you can uh, invest in your, in your test code, not just uh, treat it as a cost that uh, is going to cost us so much time. Right? So a, a bit about me, I already told <laughs> some. Uh, something, but I'm using Java for more than 10 years. Obviously, I have a strong interest in unit testing, strong interest in, uh, in uh, test automation. I love to share my experiences uh, in writing on my blog, that you can see here on the slide. And uh, it's a great honor to me to speak for the second time on JPrime uh, after the, my talk last year, which was about JUnit, uh, I mean, what else? So. Tests, right? Who who here has time for for tests? It's uh, always something that uh, is treated as something that's that's slowing us down and uh, something that's not uh, my job and uh, something QA should be doing. Maybe not not me, but what do you have uh, time? Uh, what we programmers actually uh, do? What do we have time for? How do we spend our time? And uh, somebody actually measured this. Somebody, meaning Microsoft, has a usability lab where they actually put people in front of a computer and then look at them and see, OK, now he's writing code. Now he's reading code. Now he's changing existing code. So they actually tried to measure this. And the first time they did this usability lab, which is now well expanded as far as I know, is when they were developing Visual Studio 15 years ago. So. They wanted to know what kind of feature do we want to put inside our Visual Studio. Uh, and uh, what were the results? How do developers spend time? And this is the results that they got. Uh, so apparently, writing new code for average developer takes about 5% of the time. And uh, understanding, reading, debugging code, this takes about 70%. It sounds a bit unreal because what you love most as developers is uh, writing new code, right? So is this real? It's actually pretty easy to verify, because how do you, how do you imagine a good programming day, your ideal programming day? And uh, if most of people will say something like, if they don't bother me for eight hours, and I just write, sit on my computer, and I just code for like maybe eight hours, and uh, then at the end of the day, I am. I'm finished. I, you're complete. You, the feature is, is coded. And then your computer is fried. So just a lightning grows, and your computer is destroyed. And you didn't commit, uh, you didn't push to GitHub. And now what do you do? Thank God you have a second computer. And on the second computer, exactly identical as the one. You just need to type the same again. You don't have to, everything is set up. How long is this going to take? To you? Less than eight hours, so, and uh, it's going to take you less than one hour, maybe even 30 minutes, because you already did. You just need to type the code again. You still remember. You have all your notes. So, and how many of those days anyway you you, you get? How many of your days are filled with uh, chasing a book for four hours and then changing one line of code? Like, <laughs> why don't you just you know find the line and change it from the start? So. So one ideal day, great day of work is replicated in, uh, in less than one hour. So I don't show this slide to your major. Because, no. uh, what we are trying to say is that to program is not to write code. To program means to understand. And uh, this is a quote from Christian Nigert, who is one of the co-creators of object-oriented programming. So to program is to understand. This is what we do. This is what we programmers do. But can you execute? An understanding. Can you uh, share an understanding? Okay, it's, I'm kind of sharing an understanding with you, and I'm trying to. Uh, but can you scale this? Uh, can you scale your wiki page? So, how you 
whole understanding that is concrete, small, executable, shareable, and scalable. And this is what we call a test. This is what test is. And uh, if we take a look at how we spend our time, like if 70% of the time we understand, what if we can actually automate this understanding somehow? And uh, where would you automate? I mean, if you take a look here, where, where would you automate? Of course, you're going to automate where there is more. Uh, you optimize where there is uh, more, more, where you spend more time. So a test is an understanding, understanding of the system, understanding of the system that you are, you're trying to implement. A test you understand where you don't have to understand. You don't have to hold every single detail in your head. You can just document this in an executable, kind of executable documentation. This is what tests are. And you can always verify those tests. You can automate them. You can execute them with the push of a button. This is going to save you a lot, a lot of time. What a test is not. A test is not an implementation detail. So a test is not an understanding of your system implementation. Because this is like double work. The best place to know about your implementation it will be your production code. You don't have to look at tests for this. If you want to know how, you go and look there. But for this to work, all this to work, we need to trust our, our test code. So uh, this, is, uh, this is something that we need to do. So, so I'm going to try now to, to show you some ways that you can inject more understanding in your tests and uh, it will save you time how to, how to make them more maintainable and how hopefully make them more, more trusted. So how, how do you put in understanding in your test? When a test fails because it throws an exception, maybe a no pointer exception, how do you know it's the test the problem or it's your production code? Where is, uh, where is the problem? You need to know uh, because your test is written maybe it's, it's written in code, in Java. You, you don't speak Java. Java is not very good in, uh, in translating. No, in, no of us actually speak Java. So here is a good um, one example of a test. It's got uh, a name. It's got a test annotation. It's obviously a JUnit test. Uh, it, every test has three parts. Like first is the arrange part, where you create everything that you want to test. Second is the act part. It's uh, where you execute what you want to test. And the last one is the assert. So you can remember the triple A. Uh, it's where you check out if everything is possible. So there are some problems with, uh, with this test that I want to, to point out. <laughs> um, and we can uh, inject some understanding on, on this place. So starting with the name, which is the test registration. Then a lot of nulls and uh, strings that we don't make any sense, a lot of numbers. Uh, uh, yeah, so let's, let's improve this. Let's start with the name, like test registration. It's a bit, uh, a bit abstract. So how about registration with mandatory parameters is successful? So now we know that all kind of parameters that we're going to put because it's it's a users class that has a registration. We are registering users to our web application. So those parameters that we see, perhaps those are the mandatory parameters. So this is already giving us some, some kind of information. Mm. And uh, the pattern, it's a pretty well-known and commonly used pattern uh, now. And uh, more and more popular is what you test under condition should do this. Yeah. Some people even put should before does that. So registration with mandatory fields, or registration with missing emails, of course, will return an error. Or maybe registration for already existing users, when user already exists, should return something, like maybe an error, maybe something else, who knows. So it becomes a bit harder to read on first glance. We'll see how we can uh, improve this. But uh, but this is really a nice pattern, and if you, if you, if you use this or a similar one, uh, then it's going to save you a lot of time, and we will know that, uh, what the test is supposed to do. So, but as I said, it's becoming a bit harder to read if it's these so long, long names, and especially in camel case. Of course, we want to do, just use uh, plain English. 
And uh, some people even replace the camel case with underscore case uh, completely because it's much easier to read. Or if you're using JUnit 5, you can use annotation that you can put on your, on your test. So if you use uh, JUnit 5, you can put this display name annotation. You can put any kind of string inside. This is what when the test is executed by your IDEA or Eclipse or Maven build. Uh, this is what you're going to see in the test results. Even you, you can even put emojis inside, like, uh, like here. <laughs> I, already, I already did. So you can even uh, group your tests in like a tree. And uh, so this also makes them uh, easier to read, easier to understand. And this, this grouping, like a tree, this has even bigger benefit for maintainability that we are going to see a bit later in this uh, in this presentation. So other options that you have on the JVM, you can use Spoc for Groovy, Spec for Kotlin, Scala test for Scala, there are other test frameworks. And uh, this is a typical Kotlin uh, test. In a Spec, that's a test, Spec test framework. It's the most popular test framework if you're using Kotlin. It's heavily influenced by, uh, if you're writing, for example, tests for your JavaScript code, you, you have used Mocha or your Ruby code, RSpec. It is not going to, you're going to be very familiar with it. You just describe, there is just this describe and it blocks, and you describe your test uh, using, using them. And you use, again, plain English, which is, which is easier uh, to understand. So, uh, so this is about the names. What about the assertions? What about the assertions? There were some problems there. Uh, imagine that your test fails, and you see assertion failed error. If you're using JUnit 4, uh, it's pretty common that you see, and you have no idea what is going on. You, the test fails, you see the test output, and you see this. And uh, what is this? Is, is this better? Is, you can put registration should be successful. OK, so our registration fa te test failed, and it should be successful. So how do you do this? Now, you can open your test code and, and look inside. So, there is an optional parameter that you can put in front of all your JUnit 4 um, assertion. And you can put any kind of string. And this is what's going to be displayed. This is the message that's going to be displayed. And this is assert true. Mm. Then this is the, the first parameter is an optional, optional message. And if you're using JUnit 5, they move this. They move this to the end of the assertion. So if you're using JVM5, <laughs> you need to, if you're migrating, you need to move all this parameter to the, to the back. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's not. No, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> a long time ago, JUnit 4 is uh, 12 years old. So, <laughs> so yeah, it, it may be in first two versions, who knows? Yeah, but, uh, yeah, JUnit 5 is less than one year old. It's awesome, by the way. You should upgrade. You should totally upgrade. So, so okay, we, we improved a bit the assertions. We, now, what about all this uh, magic uh, stuff that is here? What is this empty strings and nulls? And uh, what's this 5.0 at the end uh, on the, at the right? And there is some mocking happening that returns 5. Is this the same 5 we assert? We have no idea. So remove all these magic numbers, magic numbers, magic things. Replace them with variables on constants that actually explain what is going on. And now you know that the first no is something, some kind of token. And uh, you know that uh, the gibberish string is the password hash. And uh, you know that uh, what you mock, the user repository that you mock, is going to return the user ID, not five the user ID, and this is what you're going to assert at the end of the last line of the test. Now you know what, uh, what's, uh, what's going to happen. And wasn't this register with mandatory parameters? I mean, why not just uh, make a constructor that is just using the mandatory parameters? And if you are very afraid to touch your production code, then just extract a method that does this and hides all the necessary details uh, from you, so you don't have any noise, so remove the noise, remove the noise um, from this test to make it a bit more understandable. Other noise that you can do, these two assertions uh, could be combined with one in, in one line. It could be one assertion, just one. 
um, you don't have to if you if you find that you are that you are asserting multiple things on one on one object then probably you can get you to it uh, just a certain cross. You just construct the expected object and compare it. Other noise uh, you can remove. Uh, all kind of um, key to verify, verify or assert not nulls. Just uh, remove those as well. And uh, look for signs that you are asserting multiple things in one in one test, and do not assert those things. And just to be on the safe side, because uh, sometimes we, we do this, we are like defensive programming. And if you are asserting the same thing in multiple tests, also think about this, and maybe you're doing something wrong. So the point is, uh, your tests are going to fail. They're going to be executed a lot. And uh, you should make them easier to understand, very easy to read. You spend most of your time reading and trying to understand. So you should optimize for this. You can even allow some duplication. And, uh, and if you are given a choice, if you have to choose between readability and removing duplication, for test codes, it, code at least, uh, it's a good idea sometimes to, uh, to prefer a more verbose but more readable code. Yeah. So suppose we improve our understandings. Maybe we test, maybe with something else. Uh, let's say that our test optimization, they, that on our test suit, they, they save us 10% of our understanding. 10%, that more than double the time for writing new code. This is awesome. Our managers will love this. Mm. But this is. Is this free because we wrote so much test code? And test code means more code. And uh, more code means more code that we need to, to maintain. And uh, this brings to the next point, which is a test should be understanding of the system behavior and not the system implementation. Uh, like I said before, the, the best place to understand your production code, if you want to know what the code, how is it doing it, you just go there and, uh, and you do this. And if you, if you have to do this for every single, uh, every single production class and method that you know, this is a lot, of, a lot of work and your test code is going to be much more complex than, <laughs> than your production code, which is not something that you want to do. When you change your implementation, uh, uh, but behavior stay the same. The input and output of the method that you, that you change stay the same. Your test will fail if you have implementation details in your test code. And this is something that you want to avoid. And one of the, uh, one of the maybe the main reason that people actually waste so much time with test code. So what a test should know about your implementation. So if you have a a class, if you have a class called users and a method called register that you want to test. And uh, it's okay to know about the dependencies of this class. It's okay to know about uh, what is the input and output, of course, of the register method. Uh, but inside, it's a danger zone. You cannot avoid this completely. Uh, but, but you should strive to, to know as little as possible about what's inside this method. And Let's look inside. Let's look what, what happens inside. I just the two re relevant lines that we want uh, from this method is we are just calling some kind of some user repository. There is going to be a create user method for that repository. So we are going to call this, and then we are going to return user ID and wrap this user ID in some kind of user request result. This is all we want to do inside. We can make some validation as well, but let's. Uh, we're not going to talk about it. So how do we test this code? So we mock it. We use Mukitu, and we said, OK, when you, uh, when you call this create user method for the user repository, please return me a user ID. And uh, then we execute this. Uh, we execute the user's register. And then pretty, pretty often, I see a verify in the test code. Pretty often you see that somebody say, hey, let's verify that we have called the user repository with exactly what they wanted to do, and then make the assertion. But 
Uh, this is uh, what happens when a developer is writing the, the test for a code that's already written. I say, hey, this is the implementation part that uh, I want to, to test right now. Let's test it. And when you test, when you think about implementation part, you, you of course go inside the method and you, you test every single implementation detail that you can possibly do. This is why you, you verify. And test should not verify your implementation part. And in this case that I show you, it's actually not needed to use verify at all because you already can assert this when your, uh, your method is uh, returning a value. So uh, if you want to read more about the topic, you, we can make another talk for this. And actually, Daniela Larova uh, already made a talk for this last year here in Sofia at another event. And uh, he, she summarized what, uh, what experiences she had from this talk and wrote them in uh, this. Uh, she published an article on this zone as she writes for this zone. So uh, if you want to go in more details, then please uh, check this out. It's unfortunately she is not here <laughs> today. Yeah. Uh, okay. And another way, another way to, to prevent this is uh, try writing the test first. This is a very useful technique. And of course, when you don't have implementation, you're not going to have an implementation detail. It's, it's not something that's very easy, but at least start to do it for, for new code, for new classes, new methods. Maybe not do this for the existing one. But if you're just starting, just start small. Start, start with this. And uh, it's going to pay off. Of course, your, your code is also always going to be in the middle of in the intention, what's, what's supposed to happen, and the implementation. And uh, you cannot avoid uh, these implementation details. You'll know about some of them. So the question now is uh, how? How can you ease the pain a bit? And uh, I'm going to try to show you now two techniques that, uh, that are pretty common, features that you can use, uh, and uh, common test frameworks. JUnit and uh, spec for Kotlin, and uh, see how, how you can make this code more maintainable. You know, suppose we're all, always talking about registration in this talk, about user registration. Maybe it's because of the GDPR. Who knows? And uh, <laughs> yeah, so you have four tests uh, that you have written for your user registration class, maybe the users class. And uh, then you re when you look at them, you realize, hey, I, I have some duplication here. All these three deal with the case where the user does not exist. And there is only one that uh, when user already exists and something happens. Mm. So can't I just group them a bit like, like, like this? This is going to be a bit better. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, when you write test code, usually you're thinking about a class that's called uh, whatever you're trying, user's test, for example, and you have all these test methods inside. So you're trying to fit in a list of methods. But your tests are not a list, they're often a tree. Your test cases, when you think about it, we have just, I can just show it, they, they form a tree. And there are like a nested structures of tests inside, and then you are trying to fit them on this list. And, uh, and uh, how, how, how can you do this? How can you do this and, and put a tree inside your test code as well? And how does that actually help? So let's have an example. Let's change our user repository class. We want to change one method. And this method is called user exists. We want to change, add another parameter to this method. So we add the parameter. And now we have to change every single line of code that is using this method. So, so we do. And we change two lines of production code and we realize there are nine lines of test code that we need to change. Mm. And maybe, okay, we change the user repository method. Fine, it's kind of expected for the user repo test to also have some changes. But why the most of my changes are in some class that's user's class? It's, it's on a completely different place. Why, why is this? How can we, how can we do it? Let's let's look at the users again. Users test. There are four test cases there, and uh, I have already marked here that there is a 
when, like, the, the duplication that I showed. And what if we can nest them? What if we can make them a tree? There is a new feature in uh, JRNIT 5, again, uh, that's called nested. And uh, it's going to use this uh, feature to see, see how it helps. You just define another class you put inside of your test class. And uh, when you do this, you put this nested annotation. And uh, this, is, this is how, how you do this. You can even use this display name annotation we showed earlier. And it's going to, it's going to display whatever, whatever you, you put inside. So how does this help? Because what, you can, what else you can put in a test, uh, in a test class aside, aside from tests? You can put the setup methods. And you can put a setup method inside of your nested class as well. That means that first you're going to execute the setup method for the users. You're going to create the user object and everything. Then you're going to execute the one in the nested class. And now you can move all the common code because you have some code duplication in your test. And you can move all this common code to all the common setup to this second setup method. And when you do this, your code is now very simple. And uh, your test code, now the, the arrange part, the one that you actually create, could be one line. And uh, you have removed a lot of duplication for this. And now, suppose that you have written your test like this, and now you want to change the user exists method. And now from Five, four lines of code that you have to change in this case. Now it's only two. It's two because there are two, ca two cases that you want to test. One that the user exists and one that it doesn't. So it depends on the cyclomatic complexity that you want to do. So you have improved this. So from, from five lines, from, from nine lines, you now have five lines of changed code. So this is, this is better. You can do this with JUnit 4 as well. Uh, there are a few test runners that you can use. So if you are using JRNIT4, you can also do this. You, can, you don't even need to use the nested annotation. You just put inside a class, uh, a subclass. And uh, it requires the latest version of JUnit, but the latest version of JUnit is like four years old, so this is not a big deal. <laughs> uh, ID support is not that good because, for example, you cannot execute a single a single test case. You have to run all the tests in the class or, or no. All or nothing. So, Also, the problem with runners. Uh, in JUnit 4, you cannot combine runners. So you can use this for your unit test. If you want to use this for your Spring integration test and combine them with the Spring runner, this is not possible. So you have to find another way. It's possible. It's kind of very hard. So, uh, so yeah. Okay, we have, we have shown on this nested. Can we ease the pain in the other test that we have? Can we ease the pain with the user's repository test? So there are three changed lines of code there as well. This is, uh, may, maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. For, for a lot of the test code, this is actually, actually possible. Because sometimes when the code that you want to change is a pure function, there are no side effects and where there is no side effects, like email validation, then uh, it's pretty easy to, to do this. Mm. Suppose you have these five emails. Two are valid, three are not valid. So you just, uh, you just want to, to write a test. You want to, to write a class where there is a method that is going to validate those. And uh, what do you do? You write a test. Uh, for this email validation class, where there is a is valid, and you pass a string, which is the email, and you return a Boolean, which is, is it valid or not? So you have something like five tests for these uh, five test cases that I showed. And they're almost identical. Your test code, they're, they're almost identical. These two that I have shown here are, are almost the same, just one is for a valid case, the other is uh, for invalid. So what you actually needed was some kind of method called mail validation, maybe. That will just uh, have a, a string as an email and what is expected, valid or not. So now, 
uh, you just need to feed some data to this method and you're done. You can call it from your test, but now you have five tested one line that you're just going to call this. So also, also not ideal. So if you want to do this, you can do this with JUnit 4, for example, doing uh, just uh, this. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, you need to have a parameterized runner. Then you have to define your data, uh, put another annotation parameters, and then you have to construct uh, some variables and put another annotations on those, uh, which is going to tell them where in this data to find the email and where to find the expected. And after you do all this, you can finally use them in one test method. And now it's very easy to <laughs> to to write. So. If you want, for example, to have one test case for the one test for the valid emails and another for the invalid, you have to have two separate classes. So um, the good news is after you do all this setup, it's pretty easy to add and remove test cases because you just need to change the data in the collection. Still, uh, there are better ways. If you're using JUnit 5, you can actually separate the valid and invalid ones. There is another parameterized test annotation that you can use. And uh, then you define with another annotation uh, the sources where you get actually the, the data, the data that you're going to feed to your test. And then you, your test now have a parameter that's email. And uh, you can just have test that are just one assert, so one line. And another for the invalid one. Or you can just, you know, combine them. So there are even other ways to provide parameters with other annotations. Uh, you can get them even from a CSV file if, uh, if you want to. You can get them from an enum. You can get them from an enum, but say, give me every value from this enum except the OK one, for example, which is, which is kind of cool. But uh, if you're not an annotation maniac, then maybe you don't like annotation. Maybe you, know, you have heard about all this uh, functional stuff, and why can't you just leave this annotation at home, and uh, how can I just use a simple list of emails and use that in my test? So in Java, it's kind of hard. It's pretty easy if you use Kotlin and spec. So there is a list of uh, methods that's common in Kotlin, and you just uh, put what kind of emails you want uh, inside, or you can use a map of and uh, have the emails and what's expected, and then for this list of, you just call for each, and then describe, describe a test that is using uh, these uh, values from the list. So this is, uh, this is how you can do it in, in Kotlin. Also great, great uh, support for this kind of parameterized testing, uh, Spock. Spock is for Groovy. Spec is actually, for Kotlin, is actually heavily influenced by, by Spock. And until recently, I believe that Spock was the, possibly the best uh, way to write test code in Java. Now I'm not so sure. I think Spec and Journey 5 kind of catched up. So did we solve the problem? If, if we test a code that's like a pure function and uh, we write our user's repository test like this, now for two, two lines of production code change, now from nine, I have only three lines of test code, and that's uh, three times less lines that I have to change. So this is how we improve our maintainability of our test code. So use those, uh, those features. It's possible, whatever kind of uh, JUnit version you're using, and uh, OK, maybe if you're using JUnit version 3, which is like 15 years old, some people still use it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so use that, it's, uh, it's possible, and uh, it's going to be really less code to maintain for you, and um, even more importantly, less code uh, for you to understand. So now, apparently, making tests easy to understand and easy to maintain, sometimes it's not enough uh, for make them trustable. <laughs> no, we have, yeah. So, so what I'm going to show you, and uh, you probably all have uh, already seen this, uh, it's the test pyramid. You, how, how many of you know about the test pyramid? So many of you, most of you. So, so what the test pyramid it doesn't mandate, it doesn't tell us what exactly to do. But uh, in general, it says to you that uh, the more uh, your tests 
the higher in the pyramid. So if you like end-to-end -end or user interface test, they are uh, they require more complex setup. They are slower and uh, they fail for all different reasons. And your unit tests they are very isolated, very uh, very fast. And you should strive to have as many of those fast and isolated tests as possible. Maybe for your project this pyramid will not you look even not look as a pyramid. Maybe you have to integrate with so many external services that you're going to, of course, have a lot of integration or service tests. And this is what should you have more in your test goal. Uh, maybe you're writing a UI application. Maybe you're writing a UI website builder. Of course, you're going to have a lot of UI tests. But uh, yeah, you should strive to have as many of these small ones as possible. Because small tests, just like children, small problems. A lot of problems, but small. So, which is, uh, which is better. Because before you know, you now have to decide what, what, which school I'm going to put this kid on. And, and then there is a second. Yeah. So, of course, you need the higher level test. You need the integration, uh, the integration test. You need the end-to-end -end test because the sum of the very well working parts does not sometimes equal a very well working system like uh, like shown here. But in the context of this talk, I want to have a, a point that the problem, the biggest problem for me is the higher you go, the harder to know where the problem is because when the test your user interface test fails, you have no idea where the problem is. Is it the user interface? Is it in your business logic? Is it in the data that you have in the database? You have, you have no idea where the problem is. And uh, now you have to spend a lot of time debugging, trying to understand. And you can do this, uh, you can do this for hours uh, before, before you finally find the problem. And when you find the problem, what do you do? You write as small tests for this as possible, so the next time when it fails, you're going to know exactly where the problem is, so it's going to save you a lot of time. Mm. Even if your UI test is perfectly written, this is, this is something that you cannot avoid. Yeah. So, to save time, to save time with your test code, automate your understanding do not automate your implementation details. And automate at the lowest level possible. So this is what I, I wanted to share with you. This was my understanding. I hope you liked it. And uh, this is where you can get uh, the slides if you want to. And if you have any kind of uh, questions, we have uh, we have time. So. <laughs> like Mitya wanted to know how do you sell this to my manager? <laughs> Where is Mitya? Mitya is not here. Hey. Hey. Uh, I'm just curious to see your. Um vision about the TDD and how can we apply it in uh, an agile approach of development because in waterfall it's really easy because uh, the business logic is unlikely to change till the end of the development so the test will rely on the business logic and we really don't care about the implementation but in agile uh, it's really really often to change the, the business logic itself and it can change uh, drastically so the test could not rely on the business logic all the time, and we should uh, change them entirely during the development. And could be changed several times till we got the end business logic the customer wants. So how do you think we can apply TDD in Agile? I actually have a, a bit opposite uh, view of that, because in Agile you release very often, and you have to test a lot. And uh, when you test a lot, really rely a lot on, the, on a test. And if you don't have a test automation, then you should hire a lot of QAs. Well, I, we, we, we do, but uh, we should spend more time in uh, maintaining uh, the test and just modifying all the time with the current requirements. So yes, but the, they, the, then the, they change. The tile in the pie chart will become really bigger than that we saw. Yes, if, you, if your tests are bad, this, this is what's going to happen. So this is what I'm, I'm trying to avoid. I have been working in an agile environment, and uh, 
I actually think that uh, TDD is a requirement for Agile. It is, but nobody uses it. Right. Yeah, this is a problem because we don't have time for this, right? <laughs> yeah, like you don't have to actually ask permission to write tests. Okay, maybe, maybe for the higher, the slower one, for the user interface, but, but to test a method where there is a small, to, to test a method of a class, your manager doesn't care about this. You care, and it's going to save you a lot of time that if you know that this is actually working and working fine. So write unit tests for at least for those. And uh, for new classes, uh, use TDD. I use TDD all the time, but uh, I have uh, given up hope that I'm going to influence so many people to just change their ways. You have to start, start small. It's very, it's very hard. Everybody's working on a legacy project. And uh, code that is not easy to test. So, so yeah. Uh, hello. hello. Uh, what do you think about uh, code coverage? We can already measure code coverage and also integrate that in our continuous build, for example. We may fail if we don't reach certain mm -hmm. amount of code coverage. Is there a danger that, uh, in your practice, that we are buried with tests that do nothing, or do your not opinion? improve the code coverage? Yes, but improve the code coverage. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm sorry. So you are asking if uh, is a problem if the code coverage is not going to be as high? Yes. Yeah. Well. First, what you're trying to achieve with the code coverage, but actually this is most likely going to increase the code coverage. So you have to be, you, it will be make your test easier to write and easier to maintain. So you will write more tests if they're easier to write. When you have parameterized tests, for example, you just like at line line, and you can think about uh, as many test cases as possible, and it's, it's pretty easy to add more email validation test cases. So, and, uh, you, you cover your code better, and when you cover your code better, then your test coverage goes up. So, and in, in general, the test coverage is something I think that developers should uh, should know about and should look in the in in idea, for example, when you can run the test with coverage and it will mark it will mark which lines are covered and not. And you as a developer should use that knowledge and to know where you where you failed to cover it. Uh, but uh, it's when it's you are just chasing the metric, uh, it it becomes problematic. And I have deleted a lot of code testing getters and setters just to increase the test coverage. Yes, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. Okay. No other questions. All right, then. Thank you. And I'm here if you want to talk with me about bring your bad test code to me and we can discuss.